Hello, and welcome to the Emergency Care in the Streets, Chapter 11, Patient Assessment Lecture. Upon completion of this chapter and the related coursework, you will be able to form a field impression using scene and patient assessment findings. You will be able to identify the components of a patient assessment process and describe the essential actions or steps within each. Okay, so let's get started. One of the most important skills you will develop as a paramedic is the ability to assess a patient. Combines a number of steps, including assessing the scene, obtaining the chief complaint and medical history, and performing a secondary assessment. The process should seem seamless to the patient, and it leads to a differential diagnosis, which is a list of possible diagnoses based on assessment findings, and a working diagnosis, which is one diagnosis on which you base your treatment. The assessment process should be organized and systematic, but flexible as well. After the primary survey and identification and treatment of life threats, the sequencing of the history gathering and secondary assessment can be tailored to each patient. So your job is to quickly identify your patient's problems, set your care priorities, and develop a patient care plan. Then execute that plan. So let's talk about sick versus not sick. An important assessment skill is determining whether the patient is sick or not sick. And this can be based on the chief complaint, respirations, pulse, mental status, skin color, temperature, and condition. For trauma patients, it includes the mechanism of injury and obvious signs and symptoms of trauma. It provides you with the basis for determining whether the patient is stable or unstable. And if the patient's sick, the next step is to determine how sick, minor illness versus life-threatening events. So every time you assess a patient, you have to qualify if your patient is sick or not sick and quantify how sick the patient is. So let's talk about establishing the field impression. Based on your patient's history and chief complaint, a determination of what you think is the patient's current problem. You must be able to communicate with the patient and ask the right questions to make the best decisions. You must be a good detective. Shift through information gained to ask increasingly relevant questions. Develop a patient assessment style that works for you but is based on sound medical practice. Is the medical or trauma. So is this medical or trauma? Medical patients identify the chief complaint and shift through medical history. Whereas trauma patients, the patient's medical history may be less impact on your care plan. The destination may be very important. And remember that medical events can cause trauma and trauma events can produce medical problems. So keep an open mind so you are ready to respond to your patient's needs. This flowchart explains the scene size up, the first steps of the patient assessment. So the scene size up. The scene size up involves looking around and evaluating the overall safety and stability of the scene before initiating any patient care. So make sure you have safe and secure access to the scene. Make sure you are ready to egress out of the scene and consider any specialty resources you need and get them en route. The sooner you call for help, the sooner it arrives. Your main focus is to ensure the safety of the well being of the EMS team and any other emergency responders. If the scene does not appear safe, do what is necessary to make it safe or request additional resources to secure the scene before beginning patient care. It requires constant reassessment. Crash and rescue scenes often in include multiple risk and extrication hazards. The threat of another motorist disrupting the scene is always a possibility. Where an American National Standards Institute 107 or 207 certified high visibility public safety vest. And consider also wearing specialty reflective gloves, coats, and boots. Assured that your team can safely gain access to the scene and the patient and then safely exit with the patient. 
if the scene cannot be stabilized, consider a snatch and grab. Do not um, do the absolute least you have to do for the patient to be moved to safety. That's what a snatch and grab is. And establish a safe parameter to keep bystanders out of harm's way. Formulating a basic plan and visually scanning the scene should take place before you and your team exit the vehicle. Request additional resources if necessary and be wary of toxic substances and toxic environments. Proper body and respiratory protection is a must. So be wary of potential crime scenes. Law enforcement should enter and secure the scene first. If the EMS team unknowingly enters the scene first, request law enforcement immediately. And if the scene is unstable, consider retreating to your rig. So formulate an escape plan and park your vehicle away from the scene. Refrain from entering until law enforcement per personnel have secured the scene. Be aware of the potential for violence from bystanders. Patients who abuse methamphetamines can have a much larger threat than the average person. They're often paranoid and emotionally unstable and um, armed sometimes. So they may experience delirium. Never hesitate to call for law enforcement assistance. Risk related to physical environment include unstable surfaces, snow and ice, rain, Consider the stability of the structures around you. If you have any doubts, leave the area. Establish a safe perimeter. Request additional resources. And once the safety of the EMS team has been ensured, the safety of the patient is the next priority. If you are unable to minimize a hazard, consider moving the patient to a safe area and ensure safety of bystanders next. Establish a perimeter or barrier around the scene. Okay, next we're going to talk about the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. So that's written as the MOI. Um, and mechanism of injury is the way the traumatic injury occurred. The forces that act on the body to cause the damage. And it can help you predict the likelihood of certain injuries having occurred and estimate their severity. And then there's the nature of illness. That's the general type of illness a patient is experiencing. If there is more than one patient or if the patient is obese, you may need to request additional resources. If multiple patients are present and have similar problems or complaint, consider carbon monoxide poisoning or contact with other um, noxious agent or possibly food poisoning. The presence of multiple patients means they must be a must be triage. So listen for clues in the dispatch information and activating law enforcement or the incident manage, incident command system, so ICS, may be necessary. Be familiar with the various specialized resources available to you, and only specially trained responders, responders should participate in rescue operations. Assess the need for manual stabilization and spinal motion restriction. Your first priority is your own safety and the safety of your EMS team members. All patients should be treated as potentially infectious. Wear properly sized gloves on all calls and wear eye protection if blood or fluids may potentially splash or spray. Wear a HIPAA or N95 mask if inhaled particles are a risk factor and wear a, a gown if indicated. Better to err on the side of caution. Personal protective equipment or PPE includes clothing or specialized equipment that provides protection to the wearer from substances that may pose a health or safety risk, such as steel-toed boots or helmets or heat-resistant outerwear, also, maybe self-contained breathing apparatus or leather gloves. Okay, so now we're flowing down the patient assessment and we're into the primary survey. It's the second step in the patient assessment. So you have the primary survey and there's an examination techniques. And you may use three exam techniques during your primary survey. 
or the secondary assessment depending on the urgency of the patient's condition. So inspection, you wanna look over the patient and noting any abnormalities or asymmetry that may indicate soft tissue emergencies. There's palpation, you wanna to touch to feel for abnormal abnormalities and that times Palpation is gentle, but a firm touch will help you identify areas of pain and tenderness. Fingertips are good for detecting texture and consistency, while the back of your hand is better for noting skin temperature. And then there's auscultation, and that's listening to sounds within the body with a stethoscope. So next, in the primary survey, you're gonna form a general impression, and based on your initial presentation and chief complaint, the primary survey is the most time intensive portion of this process. You should be able to form a general impression within 60 to 90 seconds as you look at, talk to, and touch the patient. The general impression is your overall initial impression that determines your priority of patient care. It's based on the surroundings, the mechanism of injury, signs and symptoms, and chief complaint. It enables you to identify threats, to the ABCs, you have to avoid tunnel vision and you make conscious, objective, and systematic observations. Answer two questions. Is the patient in stable or unstable condition? And is the patient sick or not sick? The level of consciousness may provide the first clue to the alteration in the patient's condition. Decide whether to implement spinal immobilization and restricted procedures and determine your patient's uh, priorities. So identify the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness and identify the age and sex of the patient. Treat the life threats as you would find them and decide what additional care is needed and what needs to be done on scene or when, it, when to initiate transport and which facility is the most appropriate. Okay. So assess the mental status by using AVPU and also the, um, whether they're alert to person, place, time, or event, and that's alert and oriented times four. Now, are they responsive to verbal stimuli? Are they responsive to pain or are they unresponsive? And that's the APU score. And then assess the airway. Is the airway open and patent? And then the responsive patients who are talking or crying provide a clue about the airway patency. So snoring respirations indicates a position problem and gurgling or bubbling indicates a need for suctioning. And when considering airway options, move from simple to complex. The possibility of a spinal injury determines which technique to use to open the airway. So of course we know it's the head tilt, chin lift maneuver if there's medical and jaw thrust maneuver for trauma. If you're going to use a mechanical means um, to like bag valve mask the patient, you need to use an airway adjunct. So an oropharyngeal or a nasal pharyngeal. But remember, it takes considerable time to prepare. So if the patient cannot maintain their airway, use a more in invasive techniques. And this includes an endotracheal tube innovation or a rescue airway, such as a king or a laryngeal mask or a surgical airway. Now assess the breathing. So is the patient breathing? If not, you have to breathe for them. And if they are breathing, is it adequate? Expose the chest and inspect for injuries and consider the minute volume. So respiratory rate multiplied by the tidal volume inspired with each breath. Also consider, consider the breathing rate, the work of breathing, and assess for chest rise and fall. Note the symmetry of the chest wall in the depth and rhythm of the respirations, and then auscultate lung sounds. Note the presence, clarity, and any abnormal sounds. And then of course it's the C, and that circulation, so perform that full body scan. Look for any major bleeding or life-threatening injury, and check for the pulse and evaluate the skin. Assess and control external bleeding, so perform a rapid exam to identify any major external bleeding. Venous bleeding is characterized by steady flow. Arterial bleeding is characterized by spurting. And evaluate unresponsive patients by doing a sweep for blood by quickly and lightly running your gloved hands from head to toe. Palpate the pulse. And of course, we're doing the radial if they're responsive and the carotid if they're unresponsive adults or children. And then the brachial artery and infants. 
count the number of beats in 30 seconds and multiply them by two. The quality, so a normal pulse is easy to feel, a weak one is difficult to feel. And with hypertension, the pulse should it can feel bounding. And then check the rhythm of it. And is it normal? And that will be regular, irregular, if some beats come early or late or are skipped. And that can indicate a serious condition. And then report your findings by describing the rate, quality, and rhythm. And we talked about the skin color. So color, people of color, mucous membranes can be assessed. Normal skin color and light skinned is pink and dry. And temperature, so uh, rises as uh, peripheral blood vessels dilate, a fever, uh, high environmental temperatures, and then it falls as blood vessels constrict, so shock. The table on this slide shows um, the results for inspection and palpation of the skin. So restoring circulation. If a patient has inadequate circulation, you must restore it, uh, control severe bleeding, and improve oxygen delivery to the tissues. If you cannot feel a pulse in an unresponsive adult, begin CPR until the AED in the manual defibrillation is available, defibrillator. Remember to follow standard precautions and you must evaluate the cardiac rhythm of any patient in cardiac arrest with a manual cardiac monitor defibrillator regardless of the trauma or age. Oxygen delivery is improved through the administration of oxygen. And then you wanna assess for the patient's disability. So A, B, C, D, perform a neurologic exam or evaluation a mini neurologic exam includes AFPU and pupils, a quick assessment for neuro neurologic def deficits, so the glass calcoma score, most commonly employed, reliable, and consistent method of assessing mental status and neurologic function. It, uh, it assigns a point value for opening eye, verbal response, and motor response, and these values are added for a total score. Assess for gross neurologic def deficits. So move the patient, um, have the patient move through all the extremities. Assess for motor strength and weaknesses and grip strengths. And assess for loss of sensation. And then you have the E. So A, B, C, D, E. Expose and co then cover. Visually inspect areas being examined to make an accurate and thorough assessment. You cannot assess what you cannot see and then make the transport decision. So you have to identify priority patients, typically deemed to be in either an unstable or potentially unstable condition and need definitive care that cannot be accomplished in the field. Expedite transport by doing only what is necessary on scene and handling everything else en route. So there's a list of priority patients on the slide and they include CPR or hyper perfusion, uh, some complicated birth, and um, I'll let you guys read through those priority patients. Okay, now um, in the patient assessment, we're down to the history taking, and this is the third step in the patient assessment. So the purpose of the history taking is to gain information about the patient and learn about the events surrounding the incident. History of the immediate event, and the pertinent past medical. So you wanna ask open-ended questions. Close-ended questions can be useful, but generally or usually garner limited info. So avoid asking leading questions and ask age-appropriate and education-appropriate questions. So be patient and use opportunities for patient teaching. So the patient information, so name and chief complaint are the most important pieces to obtain. Obtain other info in whatever order is most conducive to good patient care and the most convenient. So techniques for the history taking. Your appearance and demeanor. You should be clean, neat, and look professional and project a good attitude. Note taking. Let the patient know that you will be asking a number of questions and writing info. So position yourself at eye level and maintain good contact and pay attention. Okay, so when you're doing the history taking, you wanna have some good communication techniques and you wanna always introduce yourself and address the patient. 
ask the patient his or her name and how he or she would like to be addressed. So avoid catch-all nicknames. Be familiar with the cultural groups in your area and with any issues that could lead to misunderstanding. And asking about feelings. So you will need to ask the patient if they're tired or depressed or any number of feelings that are most easily dealt with by denial. So try to keep unpleasant sights, sounds and smells from the patient who is feeling badly. Validate the patient's feelings. Be empathetic, but effective with your questioning. Communicate with empathy. So put yourself in the patient's shoes. Do not hesitate to communicate your feelings and address the emotional impact of what has been said. And offering reassurance. So be cautious about what you tell your, your patients. And inappropriate reassurance harms your credibility. Reading nonverbal cues is what we're going to talk about next. So changes in body movements and facial expressions may suggest pain or psychological distress or fear. So being a good listener involves patient listening. Encourage dialogue. So care decisions are based on answers to your questions combined with data from your diagnosis. Avoid medical jargon. So use layperson terminology and match your terminology to the patient's level of knowledge and understanding. Social history is not typically gathered in the pre-hospital setting. However, it provides valuable info regarding the patient's overall health status and helps to identify risk factors for various disease processes. All right, so obtaining a history of alcohol and drug abuse. So alcohol is often involved in motor vehicle crashes. Alcohol can mask a number of signs and symptoms, including pain. So be alert for the smell of alcohol on the patient's breath. Patients may give an unreliable history, and if asked how much alcohol or drug has been consumed, the amount is routinely understated, right? So intoxicated patients can be impatient, aggressive, and noncompliant. The fear of punishment for illegal drugs use may lead to denial. And keep a professional attitude, okay? Don't judge the patients by appearance or attitude. And then taking the sexual history. So talk to the patient in a setting that is as private as possible. Keep your questions focused and do not interject any opinions or biases about sexual choices or behaviors. Every patient you care for des deserves to be treated with compassion and respect. Okay, so when it comes to domestic violence and sexual assault or rape, you are required to report a case if you suspect physical abuse or domestic violence. Look for clues to indicate. And emergency scenes involving domestic violence are some of the most dangerous for EMS and law enforcement. So maintain evidence per protocol in situations involving sexual abuse or rape. Be supportive, caring, and non-judgmental. Handling physical attraction to patients. So it's never appropriate for a clinician to act on feelings of attraction to the patient. If a patient becomes uh, seductive or makes sexual advances, firmly make it clear that your relationship is professional and keep someone else in the room with you at all times. And then ensuring confidentiality. So it is your duty to maintain confidentiality of a patient information be familiar with relevant laws such as HIPAA and state laws. And then protecting the patient's privacy. You need to interview the, the patients in a private setting and be persistent enough to obtain information that patient may be reluctant to share. But do not hesitate to ask non-essential personnel to leave the room. When you gather information from third parties, if patients can't provide info, other sources on scene may be used. The further away, um, the further you go from the primary source, the greater the chance of information will contain inaccuracies though. Family and friends often function as filters for information. Okay, so they may be able to describe the patient's chief complaint, history, and past pertinent, and possibly other current health statuses. But remember, you cannot reveal medical info about your patients to their family. Law enforcement personnel and bystanders can also provide info 
If emergency care responders are already on scene, find out what info they already have obtained and the results of any care they've provided. For routine transfers, um, take a few minutes to review the transfer paperwork. All right, so uh, you must strive to understand the differences uh, inherent in all people. Most common barriers are in communication of race, ethnicity, age, gender, language, education, religion, geography, and economic status. Cultural beliefs can affect many medical decisions and treatment plans. Dietary practices and family relationships need to be considered during transport. And some cultures have identify, uh, an identified leader of the household, so establish good relationships with the person to enhance that patient care. Always obtain consent before administering any medicine. You must provide the best possible care for all patients regardless of their socioeconomic status. And remember the importance of manners, like using phrases such as yes sir or ma'am or um, possible would you. Facilitating cross-cultural communication. So identify an interpreter. So consider using a close-ended questions to avoid inact translations, right? Um, so remind interpreter that information is confidential and use a certified medical interpreter if possible. It ensures confidentiality and it understands medical terminology. Speaking louder will not always overcome a language barrier. So special challenges in history taking, dealing with talkative or reserved patients. So overly talkative patients determine whether the use uh, they, it's from uh, some type of medical problem and keep your patient. And um, patients who do not offer enough information, um, ask open-ended questions to encourage that. There's also patients who are gonna have anxiety so ex um, expect your patient to initially be somewhat anxious, okay? So if your patient remains anxious, consider why. Because high anxiety is an early sign of shock. Talking to patients with depression, so consider the patient might be depressed if he or she seems sad, hopeless, restlessness, or irritable. And then there's situational depression, and that's a reaction to a stressful event in the person's life but then there's chronic depression. And you must ask about the patient's feelings to assess uh, for risk of suicide. Also follow your local protocols. Dealing safely with anger and hostility. So anger and hostility at unfairness or, and harsh realities are normal, but be attentive to changes in body language. So establish a safe and secure scene call for law enforcement if necessary, and also retreat if necessary. Clarify a confusing history or unusual behaviors. So the patients may give you information to the physician that he or she does did not provide to you. Consider the possible reasons for that confusing behavior might be lack of oxygen or toxic environment or stroke or some type of mental illness. Manage patients with sensory or development challenges, so limited education or intelligence. And a skillful question answer approach often yields adequate information. So be alert for partial answers or omissions. And you may need to get some information from family members or caregivers. When it comes to hearing loss, low vision or blindness. So hearing loss for some patients, speaking slowly and slightly louder may be all that's necessary. Low vision, be careful to announce yourself and your reason for being there. All right, so managing age-related considerations. Pediatric patients, so initial approach should be similar to that of the adult. You wanna obtain an accurate history, um, but it could be difficult, so listen to the parents and be sensitive to the fears of the parents as well. Pay attention to the relationship between the parent and child. Tailor your questions to the age of the child, right? In neonates and infants, maternal history and birth history is going to be important. Gather an accurate family history and travel history, and renew of the system should pay special attention to skin, ears, nose, and teeth. 
geriatric patients, so can be challenging due to the variety of medical and traumatic conditions not seen in other patients. So accommodate sensory losses, and patients tend to have multiple chronic conditions, and it might complicate the history taking process. So they may have multiple complaints or multiple medications, gather all accurate medical history along with current dosages. Signs may be less dramatic in older patients, so consider including a functional assessment during systems review. All right, so responsive medical patients. The chief complaint, the most serious thing that the patient is concerned about, the reason the patient uh, called you or, or someone else called you, and it should be recorded in the patient's own words. Okay, so de determine the patient's alertness, ask about the events, and look for clues on scene or in the home to better understand the patient's condition. Vague complaints challenge you to ask the right questions and be a patient listener. All right? And so we know um, with the history of the present illness, we this information should provide a clear sequential and chronologic account of the patient's signs and symptoms. So signs, of course, are what we observe. And then symptoms are subjective information that the patient gives us. The history of the present illness is the OPQRST, and then the history of the patient is ample or sample. Begin with what is going on today and why did you call 911? If the patient's behavior is inappropriate, consider a medical problem such as hypoxia or low blood glucose. And then the current health status. So uh, it's made up of many unrelated pieces of information and often ties together some of the past history with the history of the current event. Questions that will be most helpful are, what prescription medications are you taking? And do you take any over-the-counter meds? Or are you allergic to anything? Do you smoke? Do you take illicit drugs? What did you eat today or yesterday? Do you exercise? and what kind of hazards are present in the household. So the use of safety belts or protective wear or bike helmets, gun locks, medication lock boxes. And do you have any specific disease in your family or where do you live perhaps? How do you spend your time during the day? Have you had any important experiences lately? Are you optimistic? Or decide which items you want to explore and which you do not. Okay, so for family history, it helps to establish patterns and risk factors for potential diseases. Not every aspect of the family history is necessary, and information should be related to the patient's current medical condition. So social history, occupational identification may provide information about possible toxic exposures, and the environment provides information about lifestyle and chronic exposures. Travel history is relevant, Long plane rides may cause pulmonary embolisms, and questions regarding diet may be appropriate. And then the patient's medical history. So the opportunity to learn about any pertinent and chronic underlying conditions frequently linked to the patient's current medical problem, and it should include current medications and dosages, and also allergies and childhood illnesses and adult illnesses maybe past surgeries and past hospitalizations, disabilities. A patient's emotional effect provides insight into the overall mental health of the patient, determine whether the patient has ever experienced the current problem before, and a new problem and condition is best considered serious until you prove it otherwise. When it comes to unresponsive patients, you're gonna have to rely on a thorough head to toe uh, plus the normal diagnostics tools to acquire information needed to care for your patient. With trauma patients, revisit information from that primary survey, consider the mechanism of injury, and also mechanisms that may be life-threatening include falls. So in adults, it's greater than 20 feet, children, it's greater than 10. Also high-risk motor vehicle crashes, and those are any intrusion, ejection, death of the other patient, uh, person in the uh, vehicle, or vehicle telemetry data consistent with the high risk of injury, or vehicle pedestrian collision. Also motorcycle and ATV crashes.
Okay, so this slide shows significant mechanisms of injury such as ejections um, or death of another patient in the pasture compartment. Also, um, falls of greater than 20 feet and uh, high-speed mechanisms of injuries and motor vehicle crashes of greater than 20 miles an hour or penetrating injuries to the head, neck, or chest, torso, or extremities. Okay, if the patient is an infant or child, mechanisms that um, indicate a high priority include falls more than 10 feet, um, falls of less than 10 feet with loss of consciousness, or medium to high speed vehicle crashes or bike crashes. So multiple um, MOIs often come into play during a traumatic event. So in motor vehicle crash, determine whether the seatbelt or airbags were involved. Improperly installed child safety seats can be rendered useless. And if the patient shows any systemic involvement with what appears to be a minor NMOI, continue the assessment to find the more serious problem. So let's talk about a review of the body systems and um, pertinent negatives may be a way to gain information. So some general symptoms. Um, so vague, nonspecific signs and symptoms make it difficult to differentiate between various field diagnoses, but ask questions like, um, are, do you have a fever or chills or night sweats or some type of weight variations? Hair, skin, or nails, so ask questions about a rash or itching. In multiskeletal, so ask about joint pain or loss of range of motion or swelling, redness, or some type of localized heat or deformity. With the head and neck, pay particular attention to complaints of headaches or loss of consciousness. And so eyes and ears with the eyes, ask about um, visual acuity and the ears ask about hearing. Nose, throat and mouth. So for the nose, ask about the smell. Uh, throat and mouth, focus on complaints of a sore throat or bleeding or pain or any like dental issues. When it comes to the endocrine system, ask the patient uh, has enlarged enlargement of the thyroid gland or ask about temperature intolerance. Chest and lungs, you want to screen for dyspnea and chest pain. Focus on any coughing or wheezing. Ask the patient if they've had pre previous cardiac events or um, pain or discomfort. So hematology in uh, lymph nodes, so ask about the history of anemia or bruising and then ask about tender or enlarged lymph nodes. In GI, you want to ask about appetite or general digestion. Pay attention to the signs and symptoms that point towards GI bleeding and ask about urinary habits or changes. Genetriuria, ask about a current or history of sexually transmitted disease. And for women reporting acute abdominal pain, um, ask about their menstruation cycle or when was the last period or if they've had sexual con um, intercourse. Question men about erectile dysfunction. And for men who report pain on urination, discharge, um, when was their most recent sexual encounter and if they use condoms. For the neurologic, ask about the history of seizures or syncope, loss of sensation or weakness in the extremities or paralysis. Look for signs of facial symmetry. And if you suspect a stroke, use the Cincinnati Scale Stroke or the Los Angeles Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen or another tool used in your region. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about critical thinking. The goal of assessment is to figure out the most likely reason for the patient's chief complaint and how best to address it. So recognize that there are five aspects of critical thinking. There's concept formation, data interpretation, application of principles, reflection in action, and reflection in action. So Basically, there's two reflection and actions. The first one being willing to change course as you interpret the patient's condition. And then the second is doing honest and thorough post-run critique to benefit learning. You must be able to think and perform well under pressure, and you must be a great listener and a patient listener. Okay, so clinical reasoning we're gonna talk about next. And this combines knowledge of anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, and the patient's complaints to help direct questioning when you are obtaining history. So note any abnormal symptoms of physical findings as well as their anatomic location. 
pay attention to signs and symptoms that are inconsistent with your working diagnosis. And then uh, your differential diagnosis, and that's a working hypothesis of the nature of the problem. Start with broad possibilities and consider the patient's chief complaint. And once you have determined your working diagnosis, continue to question the patient to help confirm the diagnosis. All right, so now we're moving into the fourth step, which is the secondary assessment. The secondary assessment is the process by which quantifiable objective information is obtained from a patient about his or her overall state of health compared to subjective historic information that is obtained from the patient. Together, these types of information can give you a comprehensive field impression and a differential diagnosis. Secondary assessments consist of two elements, obtaining vital signs and performing a systemic physical exam, such as a full body exam, a focused exam on a specific injury, or an exam that is based on the body system of the chief complaint. The appropriate abnormalities on, ex on examination, so you must understand the wide variety of normal presentations. As you approach the patient, consider body systems and anatomic locations. And the start of the exam is determined by factors such as the stability, the chief complaint, the history, and the ability to communicate. Not every aspect of the secondary assessment will be completed in every patient. So factors to consider when beginning an exam uh, include the location or the position, the patient's point of view, maintaining professionalism. So always protect the patient's privacy. The physical exam of priority patients. So the physical exam performed depends on the patient's need. If traditional physical exam is impossible, a full rapid full body scan may be required. A 60 to 90 second non-systematic review and palpation of the patient's body. Inspect the soft tissue and look for open wounds and palpate for pain and tenderness. Okay, and so to perform a rapid full body scan, see skill drill 11-1. Assessment techniques include your inspecting, and so you're just looking at the patient, palpation, and palpation is your touching for the purpose of obtaining information. And then percussion. So this entails gently striking the surface of the body, typically where it underlies various cavities. It detects changes in the denseness of the underlying structures. So normal lung is medium to loud with low pitched sounds. Muscle and bone is soft, high pitch, and hollow organs are loud, high pitched, and tympanic. It requires a lot of practice. So, to perform uh, percussion, uh, see skill drill 11 2. And then auscultation, and that involves listening with a stethoscope. And it requires keen attention to thorough understanding of what normal sounds like and a lot of practice. <laughs> And so this table shows normal vital signs at every age in different ages. So vital signs, their baseline is the first set. And then serial vital signs are additional sets. You want to do the pulse, of course, the rate, rhythm, and quality, and then palpate the pulse. So um, <clears throat> several, several points, including the following areas, so radial, brachial, femoral, and carotid, count 30 seconds and multiply by two. These photos show the location of common pulse points in the body. And then the respiration, so the rate, rhythm and quality, and then, um, so the respiratory rate typically assessed by inspecting the patient's chest. The quality, so you can learn um, to recognize the pathologic respiratory patterns or rhythms such as tachypnea or small respirations. And the rate should be measured for 30 seconds and multiplied by two in pediatric patients. And the table on this slide shows pathologic respiratory patterns. And then you wanna do the blood pressure, and that's the measurement of force exerted on the walls of the blood vessels 
It's commonly measured in the peripheral artery. It's a product of the cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. It's measured using a cuff that is appropriate to the patient's size and I, um, ideally should be auscultated. Blood pressure cuff gauge should be inspected periodically because it can lose accuracy and require recalibration. Then the temperature. So when using a device for measuring the tympanic membrane's temperature, make sure that the um, external auditory canal is free of serum and position the probe in the canal so that the infrared beam is aimed at the tympanic membrane. Wait two to three seconds until the digital temperature reading appears. Then use your pulse ox. So you should never be used as an absolute indicator of the need for oxygen. It requires the percentage of hemoglobin saturation. It measures that, and it can provide inaccurate information for a variety of reasons. So equipment used in the secondary, it includes a stethoscope, blood pressure cuff, reflex hammer, sometimes uh, gloves and uh, sheets and blankets, capnography or glucometry. And then you have your stethoscope. So um, the acoustic, it does not amplify sounds. It blocks out ambient sounds. And then your electronic, it converts sound waves into electronic signals and amplifies. Your cuff is used to measure the blood pressure. It consists of an inflatable cuff and a manometer, which is the pressure meter. Okay, so the physical exam we're gonna talk about next, and that's the most important skill a healthcare provider can master. You will begin to gain information regarding the patient's overall presentation as you approach the scene. So look for signs of significant distress, such as mental status changes or labored breathing. Um, obvious pain or deformity. Other aspects that may be worth noting is the dress and hygiene expression and overall size or posture, and also odors and overall state of health. So there are terms that describe the degree of distress, such as mild, moderate, or acute, severe. And there's other terms that describe the general state of the patient's health, such as chronic or frail, uh, robust, robust or vigorous. The secondary assessment is driven by the information you gather during your primary and the history taking. When it comes to the full body exam, it's a systematic head to toe exam. The goal is to identify hidden injuries or identify causes that may not be found during the rapid exam. So to correctly perform a full body exam, see skill drill 11-3. So a focus exam, it's performed on patients who have sustained non-specific MOIs and are responsive. It's based on the chief complaint, and the most common complaints involve the head, heart, lungs, and abdomen. Mental status. So for any patient who has had uh, a head-related problem, such as a concussion or headache, you should assess and palpate the head for trauma. So look for facial symmetry and uh, look at the pupils and assess the cognitive function, and that is the ability to use reasoning. So you could use the AVPU score and assess whether the patient is alert and oriented in four areas. So person, place, time, day of event, uh, day of the weekend event, and use the glass calcoma score. And once the basic mental status has been assessed, conduct a thorough mental status exam. So you're looking for general appearance, speech and language, mood and thoughts and perceptions, information relevant to the thought content, insight and judgment, and then of course, cognitive function. And uh, that's the attention. And you wanna um, pay attention to memory, such as remote memory or recent. And then you wanna look at the skin. So the hair and nails, the skin is perhaps the quickest and most reliable way of assessing a patient's overall distress. And that's to look at the skin. There are several, uh, the skin serves as three major functions and we remember it is uh, transmits information, protects the body and regulates the temperature. In cold environments, a constriction of the blood vessels shunts blood away from the skin and in hot environments, the vessels in the skin dilate. You wanna examine the skin and, and inspect and palpate the color temp condition. 
and look for evidence of diminished perfusion, such as polar cyanosis, diaphoresis, and uh, vasodilation or flushing. Okay, so you look also look at the fingernails and lips uh, for perfusion. And that's where the epidermis is the thinnest. Okay, so vasoconstriction may indicate pale skin. Um, and uh, it correlates with low arterial oxygen saturation. So that's cyanosis. Also, modeling is found in severe protracted hypoperfusion and shock. So skin turgor relates to hydration, and lesions may only be the only external evidence of a serious internal injury. Okay. Hair. So examine the hair by inspection and palpation, and note the quality, texture, and distribution. All right. Recent changes in growth and hair loss may indicate an underlying endocrine disorder. Also look at the nails, so the color, texture, or shape. Normal nail may be firm and smooth, and overly thick nails or nails with lines running parallel to the fingers suggest a fungal infection. So this table shows abnormal findings in the nails. So eyes, ears, nose, and throat, so H-E-E-N-T. So the head, so you're going to examine the head for it by feeling and inspecting, looking for asymmetry or deformity or tenderness. Evaluate the face, the color, moisture, um, symmetry, and contour. And to correctly assess the head, see skill drill 11-5. In the eyes, you want to look, uh, they're the examiner to focus, uh, you focus on the, because of the central nervous system, um, looking in the anterior chamber, posterior chamber, inspect and uh, palpate the under and uh, upper and lower orbits. You could also assess for visual acuity and um, look to see, uh, you could do use finger counting and it's done from a noted distance. And then look at the pupils. So normally round and appropriately equal sized. In light, pupils dilate. And in high light, or when the light is bright, it suddenly um, introduces pupils. Inconsistency can constrict. Okay, so evaluate whether the eyes move in harmony and uh, can track in all fields. So up, down, left, and right. To currently or correctly examine the eyes, see skill drill 11-6. Then the ears, so involved with hearing, sound perception, and balance, so they consist of the outer, middle, and inner. So you want to assess for changes in the hearing, wound, swelling, or drainage. And when it comes to the nose, it's divided in the two chambers by the nasal septum. Each chamber consists of three layers, the uh, superior, middle, and inferior. Assess anterior and inferiorly. And look for symmetry in foreign bodies, discharge, and tenderness. And note any evidence of respiratory disease. The throat, is, evaluate the mouth and pharynx. The neck, as part of the overall hydration status, pay attention to the teeth, lips, oral mucosa. And the mouth, so the lips, and um, the symmetry and gums should be pink with no lesions or edema. Inspect airway for instructions. When it comes to the throat, the size, color, and moisture, the oral pharynx, discolorations, usually odors of the patient's breath, and also fluids that might need suctioned. When it comes to the neck, look for symmetry or masses, palpate the carotid pulses, and um, to examine the neck, look at skill drill 11-17. Okay, so the cervical spine, that, of course, is the pathway by which the spinal cord makes its way out of the brain and into the torso. So consider the mechanism and evaluate for any pain or altered mental status. Indications for spinal immobilization, of course, are tenderness on palpation, complaint of pain in the spine, altered mental status, a glass cow of less than 15, and evidence of a distracting injury or paralysis. Inspect and palpate, so for tenderness and deformity, and continue assessment of the patient's range of motion should take place only when there is no potential for serious injury. When you're going to the chest, inspect uh, the superior aspect of the torso and then the anterior and posterior portions. 
Remember, it contains the heart, lungs, and great vessels. And so to examine the chest, see skill drill 11 8. You're looking for symmetry and respiratory effort in the general shape of the chest wall or for any deformities or crepitus. And then, of course, you're going to auscultate for breath sounds. Remember, normal breath sounds are clear and quiet. Tracheal sounds are loud and harsh. Brachial are low and high pitched. Brachial vascular sounds are soft and breezy. Vascular sounds are fine and somewhat fainter. Adventitious breast sounds are abnormal breast sounds, and they include wheezing, which is high pitch whistling, crackles, also called rails, and that's wet, ronchi, that's congested breast sounds with a higher pitch and rattling, strider, that's a crowing sound, and plural friction rubs, that's squeaking or grating. The figure shows locations for auscultating those breast sounds. And this one shows locations and descriptions of abnormal versions of normal breast sounds. It may be helpful to describe the sounds rather than attempt to immediately classify them. So, are the sounds dry or moist, continuous or coarse or fine? Determine if the breast sounds are diminished or absent and localize, assess transmitted voice sounds. So the cardiovascular system, it circulates the blood through the body and blood flows in two currents. You have the systemic, it carries oxygen rich blood and then the pulmonary circulation, it carries oxygen poor blood. Okay, so you have the cardiac cycles and they involve cardiac relaxation and that's diastole, filling, and then contraction of that left ventricle, that's uh, systole. The contraction and relaxation of the heart combined with flow of blood generates characteristic heart sounds through auscultation with the stethoscope. You have S1, S2, S3, and S4. Heart sounds can be heard at the chest wall in a parasternal areas, superiorly and inferiorly, as well as in the region superior to the left nipple. Okay, the sounds related to the patient's blood pressure. And as I mentioned, there are five, but only the first and the fifth are clinically significant. So phase one is clear, faint tapping sound that gradually increases in intensity and correlates with the systolic contraction. And then phase five, it's when all sounds disappear and it correlates with diastolic pressure. Feel the chest wall to locate the point at maximum impulse and uh, appreciate the uh, a apical pulse, sorry. Um, palpate for any lifts um, in the chest wall, suggesting hyperperfusion hypertrophy and be prepared uh, or be aware of any thrills, which is humming vibrations. Also a murmur and that's a normal whoosh like sound heard over the heart that indicates turbulent flow around the cardiac valve. And it could be graded by range of intensity one through six. Arterial pulses are a physical expression of the systolic blood pressure and the venous pressure tends to be low. Um, assess the extremities for signs of venous obstruction or insufficiency, okay? Jugular vein distension. And if the patient has a penetrating left chest trauma, JVD may indicate cardiac tamponade. And if the patient has pedal edema, it could be heart failure. In older patients, the ability to compensate for cardiovascular insult may be compromised. Arterial sclerosis or atherosclerosis and diabetes, medications for high blood pressure as well cause that. Pay attention to arterial pulses, so the location, rate, rhythm, and quality, and obtain an accurate blood pressure and repeat periodically. Palpate and auscultate the carotid arteries, and you're assessing for bruits. Uh, for a suspected heart problem, assess the pulse's regularity and strength and signs 
a look for the skin for uh, hypoperfusion, breast sounds, baseline vitals, and extremities for peripheral edema. The abdomen can be divided into imaginary quadrants. So you have the left upper, right upper, left lower, right lower. The ninth. So you could also divide them into nine areas, and you could see those on the slide. Contains almost all of the organs of digestion, and the peritoneum is a well-defined layer of fascia made up of the parental and visceral peritoneum. Okay. There are three basic me mechanisms which produce abdominal pain. You have visceral pain. This results when hollow organs are obstructed. You have inflammation, and that's an irritation of synomic pain fibers located in the skin. And then you have referred pain. And this has origins in a particular organ, but is described by the patient as pain in different locations. You wanna look for and obtain baseline vitals and orthostatic vitals. Okay. And then you have um, in the abdomen generally considered positive if the blood pressure shows a decrease in systolic of 20 and the blood pressure shows an increase in the diastolic of 10, an increase in pulse rate by 20. So documentation, whether the patient was, pulse was regular, if the patient was being monitored, and whether the patient was experiencing any other symptoms. When examining the abdomen, make the patient as comfortable as possible, and always proceed with abdominal assessment in the systemic fashion. So routinely performed by inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation, and in the order quadrant by quadrant. So you want to refer to skill drill 11-9. Ascites, so that's fluid within the peritoneal cavity. Abdominal may appear markedly distended. Okay, so and then bluish discoloration in the periumbilical area, that's a colon sign or along the flanks. That's a gray Turner sign, and it's indicative of a ruptured atopic pregnancy or acute peritonitis, pancreatitis, pancreatitis, sorry. And then auscultation, so it may be limited, um, but setting must be quiet for you to hear uh, bowel sounds. So practice on healthy people and note presence or absence of bowel sounds. Okay. So there's hyperactive, which is increased, or hypoactive is decreased or, you know, absent. Palpation, so that yields to tenderness. Uh, palpate each quadrant gently but firmly. And a normal abdomen should clear soft without tenderness or masses. The patient's responses are going to be the indicate pain or distress. And also guarding, that's a voluntary or involuntary contraction of the abdominal muscles. Palpate the liver. So you want to place your left hand behind the patient, parallel to and supporting the 11th and 12th rib, and place your right hand on the right abdomen just below the rib cage. Ask the patient to take a deep breath and try and feel the liver edge as it comes down to meet your fingertips. Also palpate the gallbladder and use the same technique as you palpate for the liver. And generally you cannot feel the gallbladder, but a patient's response indicating pain may mean possible inflammation. You could also palpate the spleen, and you may be able to palpate it if it's inflamed. With your left hand under, reach, reach over and around the patient to support and press forward with the, um, forward the lower left rib cage and adjacent soft tissues. With your right hand below the uh, costal margin, press in towards the spleen. When it comes to an aortic aneurysm, it may be seen as a pulsating mass in the upper midline of the abdomen. Don't palpate it, okay? If you suspect an aortic aneurysm, you want to minimize manipulation. There's also hernias, so that's a locate, localized weakening of the abdominal wall. It's not always visible, but place the patient in a supine position and ask him or her to raise their head and shoulders. You'll see it. When it comes to the female genitalia, of course, um, we're just, it's the external genitalia, ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, and vagina. Assessment should only be performed, um, it's very limited, and uh, reasons to exam would be any type of life-threatening hemorrhage, right, or immediate childbirth. 
clinical reasons for pain and palpation of the fallopian tube and ovary region include atopic pregnancies and pelvic infections. Make note of any bleeding, inflammation, discharge, swelling, or lesions. And then the male genitalia, of course, consists of the things on the slide, so the reproductive ducts, testes, urethra, prostate gland, and penis. An examination is limited with your partner present. So assess for bleeding injury or underlying fractures um, and a priapism. So that's a prolonged erection, usually the result of a spinal cord injury. And look for evidence of uh, urinary incompetence. And then the anus, that's the distal orifice of the canal and often evaluated in the same time as the genitalia and uh, assess the need for bleeding control or any other intervention. When it comes to the muscular skeletal system, you have the joints, skeletal muscles, um, principal joints of the upper extremities, and then the principal joints of the lower extremities. Joints become more vulnerable to injury, stress, and trauma as we age. Common types of muscular skeletal and soft tissue injuries include fractures and sprains, dislocations, Contusions and hematomas and open wounds and a fracture. You could have a physiological fracture or a pathological fracture. When examining the skeletal in joints, um, so pay close attention to their structure and function. Consider how the joint and extremity look and how well they work. Okay, and then refer to skill drill 11-10. You can have problems with the shoulders or related structures, often to, um, determined by noting the patient's pulse, posture. So you want to look for tenderness, swelling, crepitus, deformity, rotation, and ecchymosis. And assess the range of motion. So raise their arms above their head, have them demonstrate rotation, and perform in internal rotation as well. Also inspect the elbows. You want to palpate between. Um, and see if there's pain or tenderness or swelling, and uh, the range of motion as well. So have them flex and extend, pronate the forearms while they, um, the elbows are flexed. And then look at the hands. So palpate the hands, palpate the carpal bones, and range of motion of all. So make the fists and extend and flex, uh, move the hands laterally and medially. And then inspect the knees, the range of motion as well, palpate the hips and palpate the pelvis. Observe the ankles, palpate the feet and ankles, assess the range of motion. So you wanna have the patient um, uh, inert and exert the ankles and feet and inspect, palpate and check the foot and toes. In the peripheral vascular system, so of course it compromises aspects of the circulatory system, and you have the lymphatic system, and it's a network of lymph nodes and ducts. So the lymph nodes are large accumulations of lymphatic tissue. And they manage a key function in the body's immune system. So perfusion occurs in the peripheral circulation, and disease of the peripheral vascular system are often seen in patients with underlying medical conditions, such as diabetes or hypertension or obesity or tobacco use. During the assessment, pay attention to both upper and lower extremities. You look for signs of, that indicate uh, acute or chronic problems and refer to skill drill 11-11. Expect the upper extremities from fingertips to shoulders and the five P's of the acute arterial insufficiency include pain, pallor, paresthesia, um, paresis, and pulselessness. Inspect the lower extremities from the groin to the buttocks to the feet and palpate the pulses in the lower extremities and note the temperature of the feet and legs and palpate the superficial lymph nodes. We know that the spine is con it consists of 33 vertebrae. Inspect the back uh, from both the posterior and lateral aspects. Okay, so you have this cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. And um, just understand kyphosis is the outward curvature of the thoracic spine. Scoliosis, uh, and that's the curvature of the spine. 
And so this figure shows abnormalities of the spine, so lordosis, kyphosis, and scoliosis. Palpate the spine using the thumb to touch for spinal processes and check the rest of the back for any significant findings on palpation. Reach range of motion. So check passively first, then actively. And if the pain or tingling, um, stop the exam and mobilize the spine. So exam the spine, uh, examine. You could see the skill drill on 11 12. Next, we're going to talk about the nervous system. So the structure and function of the nervous system. The brain is an extraordinary complex structure with enormous perfusion requirement. All nerves are channeled to the brain via the spinal cord, and the nervous system is divided into the voluntary and the involuntary. So you have reflexes. Involuntary motor response is specific sensory stimuli. And you have like primitive reflexes, and then you have the Babinski reflex test that may be used to check for that neurogenic or neurologic. Okay, so the neurologic exam, it's to determine the patient's mental status and functions and uh, reflexes. Mental status exam, that's that coast map. You could see it on the slide. It's consciousness, orientation, activity, speech, thought, memory, effect, and perception. Cranial nerve exam, so it determines the presence and degree of disability, and it can be performed in less than three minutes. So evaluation of the motor system, you're going to evaluate and observe the posture and body position, watch for involuntary movements, evaluate muscle strength, check for coordination, and also um, with the finger to the nose and the heel to the shin. Check sensory function, and that's tested bilaterally. So um, assess primary sensory function, so the response to stimuli, or assess a cortical sensory function, and that's the perception of gross various light touches. To evaluate deep tendon reflexes, refer to skill drill 11-13. All right, so there are results of the neurologic exam, and so you... Um, so there could be delirium, and that um, uh, consists of an acute sudden change in the uh, mental status. There's dementia, and that's representative of a gradual um, deterioration of the co cognit cognitive functions. And then uh, common encountered abnormality. So you have the facial and extremity strength asymmetry. So you could have aphasia or dystonia or... Um, seizures, vertigo, visual changes, or tremors. Secondary assessment of unresponsive. So when you're ruling out trauma or after you have position unresponsive patients in the recovery position. If there's trauma, position the patient in a neutral alignment, uh, place a properly sized and fitted cervical collar, and implement spinal motion restriction. Look for signs of illness. Perform at least two set of vitals and uh, always assess the posture of an unresponsive patient. So always consider unresponsive patients to be unstable. Transport rapidly and reassess. So when you do the, the secondary of the trauma, there's two classifications. There's isolated and then there's multi-system. Um, okay. So uh, high visibility factor, so don't become distracted by obvious non-life-threatening injuries. Any trauma patient who's unresponsive or has an altered mental status is considered high risk. Before examining a trauma patient, make sure that the patient's cervical spine is manually immobilized in the neutral position. When it comes to recording secondary assessments, it should be done in an orderly and concise manner. And documentation requires and ensures that an accurate history accounting of the patient's problems prior to entering the hospital will exist in a formal medical record. So remember that not everything can be discovered in the secondary. Keep total time in the field a minimum. An evaluation by a trained physician coupled with lab and radiographic studies may be needed for that uh, diagnosis. When it comes to monitoring devices, 
um, continuous ECG monitoring. The purpose is to establish a baseline. And so patients who present with any cardiac related signs and symptoms um, with a cardiac input should have continuous cardiac monitoring. And the electrodes must be placed on the patient properly. Bipolar leads are used for monitoring purposes, and those consist of two electrodes, positive and negative, and they're placed on two different limbs, right? So there are times when the ECG looks normal, but the heart is not functioning properly, and we know that's PEA. Uh, 12 lead allows you to look at the heart from several angles to localize that site of injury to the heart muscle. It's indicated in any patient who might have a cardiac-related condition, it's appropriate for older patients in many situations. And the only way to learn to take a 12 lead is to practice with the equipment. Okay, so this flow chart explains reassessment, and that's the final step in the patient assessment. And reassessment, so stable patients should be reassessed every 15 minutes and the unstable every five. Reassessment of medical or mental status and ABC. So compare the patient's level of consciousness with your baseline assessment. Review the airway, the breathing and circulation, and reassess the pulse. Reassessment of the patient care and transport priorities. So have you addressed all life threats? Do priorities need to be revised? And is your initial transport decision still appropriate? Obtain another complete set of vitals and compare with uh, expected outcomes of your therapies. And also look for trends. So remember with Cushing's reflex or cardiac tamponade, you're going to start to see changes. Either with Cushing's reflex, it's going to be slowing of the pulse or raising of the blood pressure and then erratic respiratory patterns. But with cardiac tamponade, you're going to have muffled pulse pressures, um, or narrowed pulse pressures, muffled heart tones, and JVD. And so document all your findings with each reassessment. Okay, so we have reached the end of Chapter 11 Patient Assessment Lecture. Um, if you've liked this lecture, go ahead and subscribe to our channel because we're going to be putting out the rest of the screencasts from um, the 8th edition of the Paramedic book. Okay, oh, great. And thank you. Have a great night.